Very well. Um, I was mighty surprised to receive an invitation from my colleague. <laughs> oh, it has moved already. Wait, just a second. Um, here we go. Hans Hermann Hoppel, CC, a couple of months ago, well, almost half a year ago by now, to talk about the question or discuss the question whether AIDS is indeed a viral epidemic. It was surprising to me because in the U.S., or in other politically correct mainstream countries, this is almost a forbidden topic by now. You can't ask that question anymore. This is, um, and, and it is, it's only in rare, rare cases. Now I understand a little better, since I have heard him now for the first time speaking, <laughs> why he would be one of those <laughs> uh, who, uh, free thinkers who would still ask this question. And there is plenty of reason, as you will see, to ask that question, whether AIDS is a viral or the chemical epidemic. Let me remind you briefly what the definition of AIDS is, in case you had forgotten. I mean, you're supposed to read it every day in the newspaper. But since the 1980s, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, CDC as it is called, it's the Public Health Office of the United States, reported that the, consum the consumption of psychoactive party drugs, in other words, and the incidence of about two dozen Old diseases, previously known diseases, had achieved epidemic proportions in the U.S., particularly in male homosexuals and in intravenous drug users, addicts to inter heart intravenous drugs. Shortly after that, in 1981, the CDC named this epidemic AIDS for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome because it assumed that all these diseases were consequences of a common as yet to be determined cause. Syndrome means different manifestation of, a, of, a, of the same cause. The CDC definition, however, came right away with some flaws. The question um, we are asking right now is, can immunodeficiency really explain all AIDS diseases? I already mentioned some of them, Kaposi, sarcoma, pneumonia. See, I'll show you the full table in a minute. And what is the cause of this immunodeficiency that was not addressed? <clears throat> and what explains AIDS diseases that are not caused by immunodeficiency, such as cancer, dementia, and weight loss? The Kaposi sarcoma, in fact, was the signature AIDS disease, the critical one that changed the doctor's mind, in the U.S. at least, and thus in the world, because in that sector, the U.S. is still über alles. Um, the doctors are a very conservative breed, but Kaposi sarcoma was so rare, and is so rare in the U.S., 50 cases per year at the most, that most of them had not even heard about it ever before. And that this now came up thousands of times in these risk scopes, uh, made them available or open to a new idea or a new hypothesis or new theory for AIDS, that something new is happening that wasn't there before. Here are those, uh, here are 14 of those diseases. There are more, but the list changes with the addition of it. This is the last time the CDC published how they are called and how frequently they are observed in the, in, you have a pointer? Maybe not. Uh, is it, doesn't matter. Uh, they occur in the U.S. And here you see those percentages. 38% of the cases have pneumocystis pneumonia, and 5% have herpes, and 4% toxoplasmosis, and 15% tuberculosis and tuberculosis-like diseases. But so these are all consistent with the idea that we have an underlying immune deficiency because these are all microbes, fungus, bacteria viruses, herpes, they all benefit from a defective immune system. But these, among them, as I said, at that time at least, in initially the signal disease, Kaposi sarcoma, has nothing to do with immunodeficiency. Cancer is independent of the immune system. It is something, uh, 
a, a mutational event, which we can explain tomorrow morning. <laughs> Don't give me any breaks here. <laughs> so, but it, it comes to, it, it has nothing to do with the immune system, and it's not caused by a microbe. It's an, and so is a lymphoma and cervical cancer, which they added to get it sexually balanced, because it was only boys. Dementia, likewise, is not a consequence of a defective or good immune system. You can have a very good or bad immune system, be smart or be stupid. And weight loss, likewise, is not a consequence of the uh, immunodeficiency. You can gain weight and be immunodeficient and the other way around. So the solution came with the savior, Robert Gallo, in, on April 23, 1984. He and Margaret Heckler, Ronald Reagan's Secretary of Health and Human Services, called an international press conference in Washington and said the cause of AIDS had been found. Don't worry, in two months we come, uh, in two years, they said we come with a vaccine. It is a retrovirus, the type that Dr. Gallo and many of us at the time were studying, including me. I'm not studying HIV, but retroviruses. They were hardly popular because they were named as the most likely candidate for cancer virus. In Reagan's war, or in, in, in Nixon's war on cancer, money was, uh, plenty of money was given for the search of cancer viruses. So this was announced, and uh, very unusually for a scientific discovery, it's more like a political or religious event, without any documentation or peer review. There were no papers available at the time, for the scientific world to inspect and see what the evidence was. And on the same day, that's also not mentioned, was not mentioned generally, the NIH and Gallo also walked over to the patent offices and patented their work, unpublished work, as an HIV test. But the test was somewhat, somewhat odd. They didn't, they had, had no way to detect the virus because Gallo had a hell of a time finding the virus. In fact, the story is, the scandal is that he probably got it from Montagnier in France but he, because he couldn't find it. So what he did, he made a virtue out of necessity. He said we test antibodies against the virus instead of the virus. And that he patented and now blood could be tested, homo heterosexuals, everybody could be tested. Is it positive or negative? But the fundamental inconsistency here is when you look for an antibody against the virus instead of a virus, it's like you lose, you look at a policeman instead of a robber or a criminal. The antibody is typically a sign and has been so for 200 years, ever since Edward Jenner invented vaccination in 1793, has been considered as the only and the most effective way of defending against, against virus. It is, in other words, called vaccination. And here we use vaccination against this virus as an indication of a disease to come or identify somebody who should be in prison, like this girl two weeks ago in Germany and many others in the world who had sex with somebody because had antibody against the virus. For all other viruses, all, no exception, the presence of antibody signals to every doctor, immunologist, scientist, and layman even, that's protection against the disease. That's not going to happen again, or very unlikely, because the antibody makes it impossible. With HIV, it's the other way around, simply because it was said by the government, and the government scientist, that in this case it means otherwise. The disease is yet to come. Overnight, this is one of the consequences of the press release, of the, or the international press conference, the New York Times and all other obsequious media, I should say, including the Spiegel, the Kosa Independent Spiegel, all fell for the virus hypothesis. They said, Jawohl, all scientists said, Jawohl, nobody said a word. It was a unanimous uh, agreement that we finally had the cause of AIDS and now we know what to do, make a vaccine and soon it's over and we move on to the next problem. It was also immediately adopted by the gay interest organizations, of which there are many. In fact, some people calculate there are more AIDS organizations in the U.S. than AIDS patients. There are only 20, 30,000 AIDS patients, but certainly more organizations. Definitely there. They're jogging, they're collecting money, they're running from door to door. 
they beat up heterosexuals or homosexuals, whatever they <laughs> take serious, or, or particularly the, they are now after the um, denialists. That's the language used for scientists who have other theories. They deny, it's like it's religious language all around. And then it was, of course, adopted immediately by thousands of frustrated Bible researchers to which I belonged, although I wasn't all that frustrated about it, but many were more than I was, who had, be, had failed to find cancer viruses in Nixon's swore on cancer. They were well in doubt, but we couldn't find a cancer virus. I was skeptical about this one pretty soon, so they said, okay, we are so well trained as virologists, we know so much, we can't get cancer, we have to get a disease to make us clinically relevant. Clinically relevant, otherwise we'll never end up in the textbooks, we'll be somewhere in the archives of virology and we'll be soon forgotten. So it, it was clearly important to find a clinically relevant disease and AIDS came in time and Gallo has all antennas, uh, all, all, all senses out for politically opportune or co correct solutions and he presented it right as it was asked for. But there were already, to begin with, some of the scientific problems that showed up immediately. As a result of this hypothesis now, two dozen old diseases, most of which you have seen on that table a minute ago, such as tuberculosis, dementia, Kaposi, weight loss, cervical cancer, are now attributed to HIV and are even treated for HIV if antibody against HIV is present in the patient. So if the patient is antibody positive and has tuberculosis, then it's an AIDS patient. Doctors are eager to see him, to treat him. Money is around for this. They will be published in Nature and in Science. An old-fashioned tuberculosis patient rotting away a la Robert Koch uh, will be nobody's interest. He won't even appear in a, maybe in an obituary, but nowhere else. No doctor will get a merit increase on that one. But this right away. So it's called AIDS. It's called an AIDS patient now when he or she has tuberculosis and antibody gets HIV, and tuberculosis patient otherwise. This one gets antibiotics. This one gets DNA chain terminators. I'll tell you in a minute what this is. Dementia, likewise, in the presence of antibody, it's a popular fashionable disease. It's AIDS. In the absence, it's simply unintelligence or whatever you want to call it. At the same time, also, a multi-billion dollar vaccine program was launched as a consequence of the theory for which we still have no vaccine, as you will see. Now, 2009, 25 years later, after this dramatic event, oh, thanks so much, very good, uh, of this press conference, and billions of dollars spent, 10 billion roughly, per year in the last five or ten years, which was a lot of money until last year. Now everybody spends hundreds of millions. So now it's pennies, but it was a lot of money then, was very impressive. Uh, <laughs> it's more than for, was spent for all viruses in history combined, for which we all have vaccines and solutions. Here we don't. So the, there is still no, not even an explanation for how HIV would cause AIDS. And the reasons are, were already obvious at the time. HIV cannot be sufficient for AIDS because millions of HIV antibody positives are healthy, including a million Americans. That was published in Science in 81, in 85, and it's now the same number. It's completely steady. HIV is an inbred or inherent virus that probably came with the immigrants 200 years ago, although it's said to be brand new. And even the World Health Organization has recently kept a relatively stable number. They used to up them every year five or ten million, but now they have been criticized for this. Now they're stable at around 40 million. And most of these are healthy too. HIV is also not even necessary for the over two dozen AIDS-defining diseases because all of these diseases have been around and appear in the absence of HIV. So we have a very difficult match here. A virus that is supposed to be the, the, the sole cause of AIDS, according to Gallo, at the Nobel Prize now for Montagnier, is neither sufficient to do anything to millions of people and is not necessary when these, these uh, diseases appear in the majority of people who are still HIV free. There's further uh, disappointments 25 years after the 
announcement of the great discovery, as we said, already hinted at, we probably know, we have no vaccines. Remember Edward Jenner, I mentioned him before, 200 years ago, with 60 pounds, he invented the concept of vaccination and came up with the first vaccine against pox virus. VACA stands for cow. He observed that the milkmaids there in near London didn't get the, didn't get the pox epidemic, didn't get any of the, when they do, maybe there's something in the cows. They have a similar disease. He scraped it off and injected it. They said in his son and he never got it. And as a result, the vaccine concept was invented and a, and a working vaccine was available in a couple of months. Now we have the most affluent, most sophisticated, most expensive scientific establishment, thousands of them working around the globe that the planet has ever seen. 25, year, 25 years later, they have yet to match Jenner's success from 1793, not 1973, 1793. The equipment was far less, less advanced. We have no curative medications. I'll show you in a second that everybody agrees with that. The treatment that is prescribed is inevitably toxic chemotherapy that was developed for cancer uh, treatment. And the NIH funds no research other on AIDS other than linking HIV and AIDS. I have applied nine times for a grant on checking on drugs you'll see in a minute, and they were all turned down. Uh, research failures, in fact, are used quite skillfully for fundraising. In, by the, they have the best propaganda apparatus that we ever had. This is a poster that a student of mine then took in Bart, is Bay Area Rapid Transit. It's a subway, U-Bahn, S-Bahn combination. And that's the poster, that's how they advertise. They make money out of their failures. That's MFA, the largest private foundation on American Foundation for AIDS Research, uh, collecting money and say, look at this, we have 40 million HIV, uh, 40 million HIV positives and we have cured zero. We need more money. They already had 10 million, but that's the old idea. The more money, the better the solution. But sometimes it just doesn't work when you don't need where to go. Now, the, what does a scientist do when a hypothesis fails so badly? Well, at least as at, the, at the university, if I had a student who had spent now 25 years, 4 to 5 billion, up to 10 billion a year on a hypothesis and had not one result, no vaccine, no explanation, nothing, I would tell him, my friend, it's time to come up with a new theory. That's what science is all about. It's not a religion, it's, a, it's science. When it doesn't work with one theory, then we need another. So the scientists are supposed to apply the scientific method when the theory fails, questioning it, and come up with an alternative. Following our friend Einstein's, uh, one of his many uh, uh, proverbs, the important thing is not to stop questioning. And that is very, very unpopular now when it comes to AIDS and quite a few other things in science, more and more of them, in the age of political correctness, correctness that was addressed so well here already at this conference. So this is what a free scientist before the political correctness days would have asked, even possibly at the NIH. It, is AIDS indeed caused by a virus? What's the evidence for that? And if not, what does HIV do if you believe in the virus, the HIV virus. And then the, the next important question, what could be an alternative explanation? Could chemicals be a cause of AIDS? Or can antiviral treatments, which are exceedingly toxic, the most toxic tox that medicine has ever prescribed, are chemotherapy for cancer. It's legitimate if you have an enemy like cancer at your throat or at your chest, wherever it is. But if you have a hypothetical virus, it's another question. And why that's always cited when something doesn't work in America or in Europe, then they say, well, look at Africa. Africa is always offering some solution. It has these nice jungles and the black guys that nobody knows and who don't have freezers and libraries, so everything can happen there. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, uh, so <laughs> now here, the six predictions that the virus theory would make. And this is simply scientific standards. 
that I have practiced for 25 years. I was a red probiologist only for 20, 25 years. So virus is the first thing that even kids know. Oh, little one, primary school, they all, they actually are always asking, do I have an infectious disease? Can I stay at home? Play with the computer. And I said, no, <laughs> it's probably not. Or if somebody else in school have hopefully a swine flu or something, so we can play. No? So, so they know that an infectious disease, a viral disease, is contagious. When you have it, you come in contact with somebody else, the, the risk is high that he or she will get it. The virus would kill, if it were AIDS virus, immune cells as fast as it replicates. Virus is killed by infecting cells and replicating in them or change them to cancer cells in some rare cases or tumors, type of cells. But they can only do that when they do something too, not when they are dormant or not around. Since the virus, HIV virus, and that's studied over and over, not pointed out, God, replicates in 24, hour, 24 hours, like every other virus, retrovirus particularly, raus sarcoma virus, or mouse leukemia virus, or monkey leukemia virus, the disease should, if it could cause AIDS, should appear within days or weeks and prior to antiviral immunity. That's when the show is over for viruses. An immune system comes in, virus goes. It blocks the virus from infecting new cells and the, the disease is over. In the very rare cases, the immune system comes too late and then too bad, you'll be dead or sick. But that happens very rarely, otherwise we wouldn't be talking here. AIDS would be a virus-specific disease, not 24 old diseases. That's, as I said, totally unprecedented. All viruses cause, their, their IQ is extremely low. They have two or three genes compared to the 50 or 100,000 that we have, and much less DNA. So they cannot do a whole lot, but they can do one thing typically. Polio causes poliomyelitis, hepatitis virus causes liver disease and not polio, and yellow fever causes the, that disease rather than measles. So an AIDS would be also self-limiting, as I just said, by inducing antiviral immunity Individually, that is, your own disease will be terminated by immunity and also population-wise. When there's a flu epidemic, it goes up and down. I'll show you an example in one minute. And then the survivors are resistant and the virus has to move on and hide somewhere until it comes back when they have lost their immunity. And of course, much, very important, no viruses are, are sex-specific or homosex-specific or heterosex-specific, they're all random. They take what they can get. They're not that picky. They take anybody <laughs> they can get uh, as long as they can get. That is their business. <laughs> so, so, but now look at the evidence for contagiousness of AIDS, the most fundamental prediction of the virus hypothesis. You can use your laptops right while I'm talking and check whether it's true what I'm saying or not. Not one doctor or nurse has ever contracted AIDS. I'm not saying HIV. HIV, I suspect, is an, a harmless little retrovirus. From over 1 million and now 30,000 AIDS patients in America, but 1,000 of them contract annually hepatitis B virus by accident. There are five million doctors, so thousand is still a small number, and a lot of them are junkies and so on who have hepatitis, and others have hepatitis. But AIDS, in 25 years, one million opportunities for this virus to move from the patient to the doctor, who has, in fact, more intimate contacts with the patient, often by transfusions and needle sticks and cutting and surgery, than even sex. Sex has barriers built into it. But when you have a transfusion or stick yourself with a needle, then you got everything that you could possibly get. So it didn't happen once in the peer-reviewed literature that an eager American doctor would send a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine. Look what I did. I worked for 10 years in San Francisco General and have treated all these AIDS patients. Now I have Kaposi sarcoma. My blonde wife is crying, and the kids have to get out of the private stool in Putney School, and the Porsche has to be sold, because in a year I'll be dead. That story would be wonderful. The newspapers, nature, science would run for it. They would beg you for it, because it would be proof that AIDS is infectious. 
It has not appeared, to my knowledge, in any of these journals, nowhere, probably because it didn't happen. Not one of the thousands of HIV researchers, many of them, my former friends, they're all now kind of cool with me, but I see them working, Gallo in the lab, I was there, stirring in an Erlenmeyer, millions of viruses produced in an Erlenmeyer, much more than you ever get in a patient, there's no immune system in the Erlenmeyer. Not one of these heroes, as they were described in the New York Times, in the, in the front lines, trenches against the deadly virus, has ever died. Not one. Not one of thousands of AIDS researchers, and we don't have a vaccine to protect it. Or you could say we have polio vaccine, that's why they don't get polio. We have no AIDS vaccine. They work without an artist without dancing without a net. None of them get AIDS. The wives of HIV positive hemophilias, not one, not one of them has contracted ever AIDS from a hemophilia transfused with HIV virus. It's actually dead. There's no heterosexual AIDS epidemic in the US and Europe. They were predicting they would all get infected, the country would be decimated. Our young heterosexuals are dying. None of this happened. And four and a half million babies are produced in, in the US every year without condoms and without safe sex, obviously, otherwise it wouldn't work. There is no AIDS epidemic in prostitutes. They were also oh, the prostitutes, in all these porno movies, they're dying like the flies. Finally, our country will be pure again. again. Nothing happened. This. They do everything. You, on commercials, you can see anal sex, oral sex, chicken sex, three, three or four sex, horses, others included. Not one, not one of them has been. All these happy sex tourists who go to Thailand or Africa, Puerto Rico, for 50 cents a cut, none of them comes home with AIDS. The bill siding is waiting for them. Nobody has anything to say. There's no pediatric AIDS epidemic in Africa, where millions are said to be, 30% of the population for 20 years are said to be HIV positive. The kids of all these HIV positive mothers, 30% that includes certainly some mothers, would be dying from AIDS, none of this. So AIDS cannot be infectious. That's based on conventional uh, uh, standards. Here's how uh, uh, it's a model of a of a, that meets the predicted standards that I mentioned is uh, the flu, the measles virus. It's an old textbook on, by Fenner on how virus diseases proceed. There are short incubation periods. You get infected today in, the, in your school and within a few days, the few cells that get infected produce viruses at, at multiplication rates of 100 to 1,000 and and incubation periods or replication periods of eight to six hours. So within a couple of days, you have millions and billions of viruses out of the one you caught from your friend. The titer goes up and the disease develops and the immune system kicks in and within two weeks, typically, the show is over. You're now immune, you have some shingles, some, 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 some blisters and you heal and the disease is over. And this is true for flu, and this is true for Rausakoma virus and herpes and yellow fever any virus that you can think functions that way. And importantly, that was my basis, of course, or my strength in questioning this, having worked with retroviruses, it's exactly the same with retroviruses. There are no exception. You infect a chicken and a dull chicken with a raus sarcoma virus, it gets a little tumor, two weeks later the tumor disappears and it makes antibody against the virus. That's the dream for the immune system in cancer, the immune surveillance, if you have an antigenic cancer. If it's made of your own genes, which is not almost always the case, too bad the immune system cannot help. So here's the old classical flu epidemic that has been advertised by the CDC in vain now for the last four or five years. First as a bird epidemic. Few birds have died, I heard, but nobody else. For three years they hyped it up. Now they're hyping up swine flu. I saw all these gas masks at the air post in Istanbul. <laughs> but here is, that was a real flu epidemic that was in an immunodeficient population worldwide after World War I and 20 million people died. And this is from Google, this is the original data from them. Here's New York, here's London, and here's Paris, and here's Berlin. They were all about exactly the same time. With it. This is down here, you see, this is months. In a person it would be days. In a population, it has to go up and down, so it's, it's millions of people. So it started off in November 
uh, in October and in November, end of this, uh, December, it was practically over. That's how AIDS should have looked if it had been as the New York Times and Gallo described it in 84. But it doesn't happen. Now, the prediction that the virus is pathogenic after a short time is not met by AIDS as a HIV. It only causes it because they have now millions of HIV positives who are healthy. So they had to invent something to connect disease with the virus. And they invented what's called a long latent period. They said this is a slow virus. It infects you today and causes the disease only five or ten years later. What it does in those ten, five or ten years has, with 25 years, billions of dollars, not been figured out. But they insist in this idea that it's a slow virus. But when you look at the replication of HIV, which the orthodoxy has published, it is exactly as fast as every other retrovirus. Within a few weeks after infection, accidental infections, it raises antibodies, you're 100% in antibody against HIV, and the virus is no longer detectable. That's the trouble with finding it, why they use the antibody test. That's what's left, the virus is gone. But they don't want to say that, so they use polymerase chain reactions, some hocus pocus and say it's indirect, it's hidden and whatever. And now, five to ten years later, <coughs> the virus is now essentially in prison for ten years already, has been unable to do anything. Now it knocks out the infected person causes disease 10 years later. That's what they say. When you look in the dying AIDS patient, there's still no virus, only antibody. I mean, there's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit, one in 100 to 1,000 cells at most is infected. At most, free virus is not to be seen. But since it comes from the US and comes from, it's like when it came from Rome 100 years ago. It is not to be questioned. The prediction of a viral epidemic that is self-limiting failed. It, this here shows, although it does look a bit like a bell-shaped curve, you have to look at the abscissa to see what, I'm, what they show. This is the Centers for Disease Control publishing. The AIDS epidemics in Australia and Canada, United States, Spain, Italy, and they all go up slowly and then come down somewhat, and now they're stabilizing around somewhere at this point. They're now about at the same level here. So this is not a self-limiting epidemic. That is an epidemic that lasts over a long time, which is typical for diseases like lung cancer from smoking, to give you a hint. Here, an, 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 a viral epidemic should actually also fall, uh, correlate or coincide with the distribution of the virus in the population. And here is the distribution of the an embarrassment to the AIDS establishment. They never show it, actually. They don't like to show these pictures to you. They published in 85 that one million Americans were HIV positive. And they published just now in 2007 in the latest edition of HIV AIDS surveillance from the CDC, it's still a million Americans HIV positive. That virus has been a steady point, what one, let's say, roughly, uh, a fourth of a percent or a third of a percent of the population ever since it can be detected. No gain and no loss. It's extremely steady. That is the hallmark of a long established virus. Herpes virus is 30 or 40 percent, papilloma virus 60 or 70 percent, completely steady, stable, typically relatively harmless passenger virus. They are there for, for a new virus does this exactly as the flu thing and goes down or we go down. That's the other possibility. That's what they predicted. We would go down with it. But the virus didn't go up, and we didn't go down. So far, at least. They didn't see it. So the prediction virus would be random is also flawed. Since the beginning of American AIDS, even now, with all the manipulations, they try to get any women in for anything they can possibly do. 80% uh, are still male, and 20% were females. Oh, and, and this is not non-random enough. Even among those males, it is very picky, this virus, if it is a virus. Uh, the, a third of them are very non-random, IV truck users, although truck use is common in, in America now, but certainly not that common, that it would be a third of, them of the, it would pick only IV truck users, and two-thirds are male homosexuals, but again, only those who use uh, 
psychoactive aphrodisiac talks over many years and actually flaunt that they have thousands of sexual contacts. It's like in the Olympics, the, they break the old records in the bedrooms with chemicals like they break them now in the Olympics with chemicals as well. Yeah. Uh, what is the overlap between the This is the total of the U.S. AIDS population. No, or AIDS. Yeah, yeah, they would be separate. Yeah, they say, they list these as IV talk users. They have also overlap between them. But roughly two, one third in, in the US are IV talk users, and two thirds are, consider, are said to be male homosexuals. And there are so five, ten percent left for hemophiliacs and things like that. Yeah. And then there is, of course, a normal incidence of these 20 diseases. They haven't disappeared. They have all been there before, except at a very low rate. Nobody paid attention to it. So it's highly known random, as, which is totally uncommon for uh, a virus, as I said. So the conclusion then is AIDS cannot be a viral epidemic. It is not contagious. It is highly non random. It's group specific in the US and Europe. Africa is, of course, the exception there. We can talk about this a little later. It is not self limiting by antiviral immunity, which all microbial infections are. If it, they weren't, again, I would say we would not be sitting here. One, some, the microbe that isn't, could not be limited, a pathogenic microbe by immunity, would wipe us out and itself out. It's a fatal combination. And that has never happened and is independent, AIDS is independent of HIV because it occurs, if at all, only five to ten years after the infection when the virus is essentially long neutralized. So what's left for the virus, it's a, could it be a passenger virus? Hardly anybody ever talks about them. It's the vast majority of all viruses. They do, as we say in Oakland, know nothing or hardly anything, very little. <laughs> they, they are around for the right, like a passenger on an airplane, but they don't determine when you start and where you land and what happens in between. So many viruses are that way, rheovirus, cytogamite, gallovirus, and particularly the retroviruses. All the retroviruses we have, with very few exceptions, that have these oncogenes, do actually nothing. They are harmless passenger viruses. So a passenger virus is then defined by a virus that doesn't cause a disease, a given disease occurs with or without it, without making any particular difference. You can get Kaposi sarcoma with HIV and without. But we, it just happens right now. So HIV meets the passenger exactly, even in, in molecular biological detail, only antibodies around, I already said, only one in 500 to 1,000 T cells is ever infected. That was determined with these most sensitive methods called polymerase chain reaction that detects a needle in a haystack now. You, we couldn't even see it until Kerry Mullis had invented that method, got a Nobel Prize for it, but he didn't help them either because you can't die from losing one in 500 or 1,000 T cells, even if they were all killed by the virus. It's less than cutting yourself while you're shaving every day. You could survive that for a very long time. Expression of RNA is non-correlated. It's minimal anyway, but with a polymerase chain reaction you find a little bit sometimes. But it could be high or low in asymptomatic carriers, and it could be high or low in symptomatic carriers. There is no correlation between the dosage or the title of viral RNA as low as it is and the disease. And here is what, when, does, when that came up irrefutably, a year, two years ago in JAMA, what the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, this is Fauci's headquarter at the NIH. Fauci is the, now the nation's leading AIDS researcher, Anthony Fauci. It has been so for 25 years. It's getting a bit old, uh, so do I actually. But he even more, I think. He was old already then. So, <laughs> so it, the, what they say about the non-correlations between HIV expression and AIDS, this is a quote from JAMA, which is a very prestigious mainstream medical journal in America. They, they can say that. Somebody put, made that point earlier to do. The Spiegel can say it. They can show a few fiastigas in the Führer here then. But if I did, it wouldn't look so good. But here, 25 years into the HIV epidemic, a complete understanding of what drives the decay of CD4 cells. That's the immune cells that HIV is supposed to kill. The essential event of HIV disease, they call it 
presumptuously HIV disease when not much is happening, is lacking. 25 years, Nobel Prize later, billions of dollars later, we still don't know what's happening. Montagnier just said on television, if you have a good immune system, maybe you get nothing. Just last week. But he has a Nobel Prize, can get away with it too. The findings presented by the Rodriguez et al., this is the study that showed these non-correlations most recently, in the same journal, support those who favor non-virological mechanisms as the predominant cause of T cell loss. Guess that, who, who that could be? I have never heard of one. Anyway, the sustainability of the current paradigm for the more than 40 million HIV-infected individuals and the more than 4 million new HIV infections per year is at best questionable. And that's the $10 billion paradigm in the U.S. and actually the world. It's, uh, everybody follows it with, a, uh, with a Fidel Castro in Cuba locking up HIV-positive Cuban soldiers because Dr. Gallo from Washington has said that's not so good, and so did Brezhnev in the good old days when the Iron Curtain was still there, and so does Dr. Gallo at the age. So can chemicals cause AIDS? Having eliminated virus and microbes is causes what is left. Well, here I'm consulting Sherlock Holmes. How often have I, that's what he said to Watson, <laughs> his assistant, how often have I said to you that when you have eliminated Eliminated the impossible. Whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. So it's a <laughs> classic Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> what is it? So what, what could cause a new epidemic or a, a new ep a epidemic of new diseases, whatever you want to call it? There are only two choices for a new epidemic of diseases, like AIDS is said to be. Only two. It's either germs. And that's what they all like, particularly the CDC. We, have, we can make a vaccine. We are in the textbooks. It's clean. Nobody is to be blamed. And we are good Americans or good scientists and in textbooks forever and rich and, and uh, famous. Or it's chemicals, alias lifestyle, which is not very popular. Not one of the five million American doctors who, who cured, cured the AIDS patients and treat them anywhere and publish them. Not one of them ever publishes the drug use of 20 million fellow Americans who use illegal drugs every day. Not one of them. You don't read anywhere anything about it. That's not done in America, and including it's not studied by the doctors. They go three times around the globe to find an AIDS patient with a high or low T cell count. But for 20 million Americans that are addicted to drugs, they are not talked about. They are not mentioned in the 21st century. That's not something we talk about, and we don't deal with them. They rot on the street. You can see them in Oakland or somewhere. It's, it's very odd, and certainly not very romantic when you think about Hippocrates, who came from an island here 10 miles ago. So they, they, this, this must be 20 million potential patients. There's not a publication anywhere what heroin, cocaine does, and why they do it, and what could be done about it. But HIV, tons of money. Vaccines, we have 50 billions for Africa, give condoms and drugs, and talks, but not a word about our own junkies in Oakland or in San Francisco or New York or Los Angeles. Nothing. That is, uh, no doctor would touch it. It's not good for the reputation. As an example of one here, the, the new germs was the flu epidemic in 1980, 1920, in 1820, which I showed. As an example for two, is the lung cancer epidemic that started in Europe and in America in the 30s with uh, widespread cigarette consumption availability. So hardly anybody remembers now that in 1981, three years before HIV AIDS, AIDS researchers had advanced the lifestyle AIDS hypothesis, again in the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine. One of the survey authors, there were six groups. One of them was Durak, who wrote an editorial to it. He's still working now on AIDS, but studies ACT, has forgotten about this altogether. According to this hypothesis, the massive consumption of recreational party and sex drugs, like nitride inhalants or poppers, amphetamines, cocaine, was the cause of the then new AIDS epidemic. In the U.S., this drug epidemic started after the Vietnam War and soon after in Europe. The Beatles, 
the Yellow Submarine and the Rock Stars. We're all high on drugs and are still today. Uh, not quite as high as they used to be. And all the Woodstock and partiers, they go for two or three nights without sleeping. High on whatever. Lots of good stuff. Better than ACT, that is. <laughs> so here's the chemical basis of AIDS that I would uh, trans now. In line with the original, it's not even original for me. It's, come, they, it's published in the England Journal, but conveniently forgotten. The chemical AIDS theory says AIDS is a consequence of the long-term consumption or exposure to recreational drugs, anti-HIV drugs, or malnutrition. That's chemistry too. If you don't have enough to eat or water to drink, your immune system goes down and you get what the Africans have, the the poor Africans have, and others. The the cumulative or long-term effects of chemical AIDS risks explain these long latent periods that are now uh, attributed to the slow virus HIV that is immunogenic in weeks like any other virus but slow in causing a disease sometimes 10 years later. So here is some evidence for this drug AIDS theory or hypothesis. Here is how AIDS went up and down. Well, it's it's not really down. This was an update. They're usually the last year is low and then they have late reporting. It's like this about now. This comes up later, a year later, so it's from the CDC, so it's about in the middle now. It's not as high as it was in 93, but it's it's somewhere in the middle. And here are the, they are harder to get these numbers. You never see them in nature or science, the drug use, illicit drug use that I mentioned in America. You have to go to the National Institute on Drug Abuse or to some uh, drug surveillance organization. They send you in brown paperbacks some material. It's not openly published, but it is, I mean, it is government numbers, and they are not very accurate, but close enough. And you can see this was America at the days of the French connection, when it was sensational. Rod Steiger played the role that somebody caught a kilogram or two of cocaine in, or, or heroin in, in New York, somewhere in the harbor. And now we are importing or ca- we are confiscating. This is the confiscated. That's a fairly solid number by that at the drug surveillance agency, about 100 tons of cocaine per year. And they estimate they catch about 20 to 25 percent of the good stuff. The rest goes to the clients, the consumers. So America consumes roughly 400 tons of cocaine per year, and about you know, something like uh, more like 10 or 20 tons uh, of heroin and the con- confirming figures are also cocaine hospitalizations. That means uh, d- d- diseases or collapses or episodes that come from overdose or from long-term dose of thing. This went all up together with AIDS, the, with the drug t- t- epidemic and the AIDS epidemic. I, mean, it's, I can't claim this is a perfect coincidence, but it's close enough. When you check the literature before AIDS, when it was still possible to publish uh, what recreational drugs do. Starting 100 years ago in the French literature when, when it was very popular to use cocaine. Sigismund Freud in his office has a kilo jar of cocaine. He got all these girls on the couch for a little bit of cocaine. And so Marcel Proust used cocaine, Sherlock Holmes used cocaine, the, co- the Pope used cocaine. It was a very popular and chic thing to do. And when you had a cough, you used cocaine. In Bayer, in the cough syrup, it was cocaine. In Coca-Cola, it was cocaine. So even Americans used cocaine then. So, and they described the first paper on it is French paper. Oops, okay. On uh, immunodeficiency observed in long-term cocaine and heroin uses. 1908, in the Canton du Epta And then comes, then is literature on Kaposi sarcoma, and these are abbreviations of the drugs that cause any of these diseases in long-term uses. And C is is cocaine, H, heroin, and nitride inhalants, A, amphetamines. So Kaposi is almost exclusively found in nitrides and candida. And see, these are all AIDS-defining diseases, and these are diseases beyond, that are not considered AIDS-defining. Premature birth, impotence, severe arteriosclerosis, tooth loss, carriers, dermatitis, hepatitis, epileptic seizures, endocarditis, and bronchitis. These are 
not AIDS defining yet, but all the others, diarrhea, thrombocytemia, night sweats, spontaneous abortions, dementia, weight loss, tuberculosis, pneumonia, candida, all of them are AIDS defining diseases. That's how you get these diseases. But again, that is not cited in the AIDS literature. Everything is reduced to the virus in some way or another. So the epidemic, as I said earlier, is not self-limiting. It goes on over years. Or the epidemics, which is typical for drug diseases, there is no immunity against drug diseases. There is no immunity against liver cirrhosis when you drink a lot of schnapps, and no immunity against uh, uh, emphysema when you take too much tobacco. American or, or European drug risk groups, as I already pointed out, a third of all American and half of the Europeans are IV drug users, two-thirds are male homosexuals, and minor groups are transfusion recipients who res receive the, the, the long-term transfusion of factor VIII or clotting factor is immunosuppressive in hemophilia. And it has been published again before. It's proportional to the lifetime dose of units of, of clotting factor that, have, the, that they have received. The CDC here. In 1983, the last year when you would have seen that, now after, after, after April 2084, they converted overnight to the virus hypothesis and drugs were forgotten, not mentioned by hundreds of AIDS researchers the next morning. They all had their grants written now for HIV, rewritten. And here's what the CDC, they took these pilot groups of male homosexual AIDS risk groups, 50 had already AIDS, 120 we at risk for AIDS. And there are more, more, quite a few more of these papers. And here they list faithfully what these guys self-reported. They, they didn't even test it. They said, what do you guys use? Okay, 96% use the poppers, which gives you a high and facilitates anal sex. It relaxes the smooth muscles. It was invented 100 years ago for in China. If you have an attack, you pop a vial, inhale it, and your muscles are relaxed and you get rid of the constriction or whatever that is. And in the 60s, everybody figured out, and it checked out everything for psychoactive effects. And they said, oh, you get a high, it's fun. And it's also used in discos here and then, but heterosexuals use it less consistently because the plumbing is different. They don't need relaxing uh, the, 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 the anus for sex. The, the plumbing is different, so they're independent of the nitride inhalers for sex. Whereas some of the gay men, some of them I knew very well, they said, when you're really into it, you don't need a date anymore. It's all you need is the, the light at hands. It becomes autonomous, like many drug users say. Acyl chloride is another one that gets you high. Cocaine, amphetamines, phenylcycline. And you can see these percentages are overlapping. They use these all together, or overlapping, or one, on Monday one and the Tuesday the other. And there's one, only one entry in that table that comes from me. It's the last one. I checked this paper and subsequent ones from them. Is in those groups that they looked, any one of them says, I've never done it. I'm an angel. And there was not one of them. I mean, not one of them who said, I'm just a drug-free homosexual. There was not one. So, well, honest guys. You know, that's what I have to say for them. Now, I'm not complaining, but, but they, they're not told. Why should they not use it? Five million American doctors tell them, we are not policemen, as long as you use your condoms and pray to Anthony Fauci and George Bush, you'll be saved. That's what they do. Real doctors. Can anti-HIV treatments, that's the last chapter in the book here, can they cause AIDS? In 87, the AIDS establishment has opened up a new chapter of chemical AIDS. The prescriptions of anti-HIV medications to now four to 500,000 Americans every day. It's the best business also for the drug companies they ever had. These. So antiviral drugs are inevitably toxic. In and this is why. In principle, a specific antiviral drug is biologically impossible. Nature has been around. Whenever nature hasn't been able to do something, you can count on it. There will be no scientists who ever will do it. The only thing that works is antibodies, immunity. That works, and that works very well with HIV, so well that Gallo couldn't find it and almost lost his job when, he, when they fully figured out he stole it. So this is because the cell makes all macromolecules for the virus. The virus is just like you stick a program in your computer. 
It cannot write one sentence. It can only tell the cell what to do. And the cell makes viral DNA, RNA, and protein. So in order to inhibit the virus, you have to inhibit cellular protein, DNA, or RNA synthesis. In other words, you have to kill or intoxicate the cell. And this is the reason why there is no antiviral drug. And ACT is, was originally designed as a DNA chain terminator, inhibits viral DNA synthesis, but inhibits human DNA much better. Human DNA is 10 to the 9 nucleotides, viral is 10 to the 4. It's about 100,000 times bigger. It's like shooting a battleship or shooting the captain of the battleship. If you could get the captain, maybe you could get the ship, but in most cases they shoot the ship in order to get the captain at the end. It's much easier. It's bigger target. So this is how it looks. You know, the DNA is out of these four nucleosides, adenine, cytidine, guanidine, cymidine, and they have two arms. And then the enzymes connects the arms, and then we get uh, these chromosomes in which roughly close to 10 to the 9, 10 to the 8 per chromosome, about 100 million are connected to form the DNA strands that are in all of our cells. Now you throw in it an, an analog, AZT, is called acetocymidine. It's a, it has, this arm is cut off. There's a fault, faulty molecule there. It's, it's a, a, a acido, a, 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 a chemical group, the nitride group that, is, that the enzyme doesn't recognize, so the DNA stops and the cell dies. It's a clever thing, or it's a pretty good thing for chemotherapy. Collateral damage is enormous, hair fallout, the immune system goes, the guts die, but in many cases the cancer goes before the patient goes, and that's the rationale and the strategy of chemotherapy. It's not pretty, but sometimes works, and therefore it's justifiable. But here we are fighting with a phantom virus that does no nothing, as I already told you. It makes no DNA at that time. If it made DNA, it was 10 years before the immunity, but not now. I've studied it a little bit. I didn't get it from the drug companies that package it nicely with unicorns and nice labels on it. This is from an old-fashioned, honorable biochemical company, Sigma, huge, right, by the way. And I got 100 milligrams to test it in cells in tissue culture, how toxic it is. And it comes with this warning, skull and crossbones. That's about the highest warning for toxicity they have. For 100 milligrams, this is the fifth of the dose that is the standard of care for a pregnant woman in the second and third trimester when she's HIV positive. For a baby, developing baby. Remember, in the U.S., they were not supposed to drink even a 2% Anheuser Busch beer because it could possibly do something to the fetus. But now, under the Fauci and the, and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, request and recommend 500 milligram per day for a pregnant mom for the baby, making DNA like crazy. Because the virus is even worse than, the, than this guy. Hmm? And here's what it says on it, toxic by inhalation, in contact with skin. Target organs are the blood bone marrow. That's where the immune cells come from. If you feel unwell, seek medical advice. This is what they say to a PhD or a professor at university with a lab, the lab coat, the gloves and everything. You studied five or ten years how, who knows roughly what to do, wear suitable clothes. But mom takes it for the baby when she's HIV positive, or else the doctor puts, gives her help and makes her. So this is what ACT side effects are, or side effects as they call it. It's the only effect it has. It kills uh, cells by terminating DNA. So the next four slides give you some evidence for this. And then here, Nature, Maddox, the editor of Nature, his editorial hyped this up and said, see, Duisburg is wrong, I'm wrong. We show it here with hemophiliacs. The hemophiliacs in, in England, they, they, they did really fine until HIV came around in 86 and 87. Well, that's when it was discovered and tested. And before then, they didn't test it. What he didn't say so much in the paper, but it was in the, five print, five, uh, in the fine print, is that the HIV-positive hemophiliacs who are dying, as you can see here, the HIV-negatives are doing fine. And they are dying, here, and the same with severe hem hemophilia. What he didn't say, these are the ones who got ACT. 
And he said, well, this break me, me to this conclusion, but this conclusion may be wrong. It, it shows that HIV is, is bad. Well, HIV was not invented or born in 86. We know from, from, from these st uh, steady curves that it has been around probably for millions of years, like all other viruses. I don't think God has been active recently. Maybe in Carlos' lab, but certainly not otherwise. So, the, another serious point is, over 50% of American AIDS patients now die not from these 12 or 20 AIDS-defining diseases. Instead, they die from liver, heart, and kidney diseases. Guess why? These are the target organs for to toxicity. The liver and the kidney, that's where it goes through. And the heart, where the DNA chain terminators ter kill the, the mitochondria. It's a consequence also of chemotherapy that even younger uh, cancer patients die 10 years later they, without cancer from a heart attack because the, the mitochondria they have DNA in them and that's terminated and that, that's the powerhouse of the muscle cells and the heart is one that never sleeps. If you damage the mitochondria, they don't come back and you, there's a, again a cumulative effect. So these are the diseases and this is not, uh, I'm just showing you here, you can copy them later, these references that say that from the AIDS orthodoxy, they have this code which is hard to learn, but it's like a language. Grade four events are as important as AIDS events in the era of heart. That means in German, um, toxicity from, from ACT is as important as AIDS event as, uh, as, as HIV, I assume. In the era of heart, these are the highly active retroviral, antiretroviral therapies, in, in other words, ACT. So they recognize it, and as yet, it is not an HIV, an HIV or AIDS-defining disease. Heart, kidney, and liver diseases, which is the cause of death for 50% of American AIDS patients. Not pneumocystis, pneumonia, or carposing. This is what it's now, in the era of heart highly active antiretroviral something, DNA chain terminal. <laughs> and here's an article from Lancet, very revealing, with hundreds of British and American authors, entitled HIV Treatment Response and Prognosis in Europe and North America. Their conclusion, in red, not by me, by Lancet, the virological response after starting heart improved over calendar years. In other words, they say they can do inhibit whatever is there from the virus better than they before. But such improvements have not translated into a decrease in mortality. In other words, they have not helped the patient live a day longer. And I suspect this may be a euphemism, but maybe it's right. I, I, it would be nice if they would live as, uh, they would live not, they, they would die not sooner with these drugs than without. Biochemically, I think it's very, very unlikely. But it, they used to say they live longer from it. Now they say they don't live longer anymore. Soon after, might be, they would say, a little bit shorter, but <laughs> I don't know what to say. So Af African AIDS, maybe we can cover that in the discussion. I, oh, let's say maybe I could summarize in this one briefly what the two theories predict, the AIDS facts and what each of these theories predict. The viral theory would, of course, predict a vaccine, and a vaccine that hasn't shown up. So this is a count against the viral theory and for the chemical. AIDS theory because chemi chemicals, there's no vaccine against chemical toxicity. There's no virus, only antibodies against HIV to be found in AIDS patients. It's a negative for the virus theory and a plus for the chemical theory. <laughs> Antiviral drugs do not cure AIDS. A negative for the virus theory, again, a plus for the chemical theory. Uh, AIDS, five to ten years after neutralization of HIV, uh, Ne unprecedented negative, therefore, for the virus theory and a cumulative effect of drug use for chemical aids. The time causes of the epidemic follow lifestyles not self-limiting by natural immunity, again, consistent with chemistry, but not with viral in, uh, disease. In the U.S. and Europe, the epidemics are restricted to risk groups, drug using male homosexuals and intravenous drug users, again, a plus for chemistry and not for virus. In Africa, there's a plus for the virus theory, after all, we can discuss that. In the, in the epidemic uh, in Africa is said to be random in the population, and that's 
that's what the chemical theory would say and also the uh, virus theory says. The answer in a very short nutshell, it's, it's the, 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 chemis, the chemicals in Africa are, is malnutrition and no running water and poverty. And that's why it's, and those are both bisexual, I mean girls and boys are equally poor and they get, they die from that. The doctors and the tourists never get it and the scientists traveling in Africa never come home with AIDS. But the people who are uh, drinking out of the same river where the, they bury their cadavers and so that's where the problems are. AIDS uh, in contact infection, no contact infection for AIDS in 25 years and a million opportunities, very negative for a virus. No virus would make a living if it couldn't make it from one host to the next in, 25, in one million opportunities in a in year, but consistent with stocks. And so is the pediatric, the no pediatric AIDS epidemics in Africa, particularly in, in the world, likewise. So my last point is when it's here, just in how you could prove me wrong or this wrong, this proof this find a contagious AIDS in drug-free subjects and show that in two matched groups, say of U.S. soldiers, and I picked those specifically because well, I know them a little bit, <laughs> and also the, U the U.S. Army t carries out three million HIV AIDS tests since it's also a government ag agency since 1985, but they never say a word what happens to the positive. They have one in thousand positives. That's a good number out of three million. You could do a perfect study, matched study, take thousand soldiers HIV positive and thousand negative and give him a call every six months. Do you have Kaposi's sarcoma or pneumonia or how, or how are you?